Good afternoon to you all. Welcome. I'm Kate Rowley, one of the senior Hermagritus inspectors in the North East Yorkshire and Humber. I'm delighted to be here with you today and for the next four sessions, working with my colleagues to share some of Ofsted's research and inspection methodology with you. While we've all got our cameras on, I'll pass to my colleagues to introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Kirsty Godfrey, one of Her Majesty's Inspectors and also Ofsted's subject lead for early reading. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Claire Brown. I'm a Senior Her Majesty's Inspector in the North East Yorkshire and Humber. And this afternoon, I'm going to be supporting with the questions. Um, so if you do have questions that you want to ask, please just pop them into the, the question panel, send them through to us, and we will pick those up, hopefully at the end of the session. And any we don't have time for, we'll roll forward to the next webinar. And just to make you aware, if you've got any technical issues or queries, pop those in the box too. And our brilliant technical support, Lillian and Jane, will help out with those as the session continues. And now I'll hand you over to our regional director to open today's session. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Emma Ng, and I really wanted to welcome you to this very special event. I think it's the first one in the country, though I'm sure other regions will be copying us soon. It's really important to us to have this opportunity to talk to you. And I wanted if I could just spend a moment reflecting on, on how this came about. When I first came to the region as regional director, which was in 2019, back in the days when we still had lots of performance data, the thing that stuck out on a page is that children in some areas do better at different stages of their education than they do in others. And then it almost reverses at other times. And the question that really leaps out at you off a page of data about our children is why do some do better than others at different stages? Why do they do better here at key stage one and better there at key stage two and less well there at key stage two? It's very confusing. And I talked a lot about this with my colleague Kate, who's hosting today. And we felt that the research that we've done here in Ofsted and the thinking that we've done here in Ofsted may shed some light. Now, we know that there's a lot to do with deprivation. There's a lot to do with family issues at home. There's a lot to do with the impact of COVID. There are all sorts of reasons why some children do better than others. But there are also schools that buck the trend. And what we wanted to do over the course of the few webinars that we're offering is to share what the best of the thinking, what the best of the research is saying about why some children can do better than others, why some schools seem to get it cracked, and what we can all do, because we're in this together to get the very best for all our children, what we can all do to try and get the best for everyone. So I'm hugely grateful to Kate and Kirsty and Claire the team as a whole for putting together this first session, this first webinar on what it is that works in schools that might be helpful to you both in doing the very best by your children because I know that's what we all want uh, and also thinking about the way we inspect and what you might want to share with us down the line when we come to visit. So over to you Kate uh, and with grateful thanks to you as well for setting this up and making it happen. Thank you Emma. Since joining Ofsted from Headship, I've had the opportunity to be part of a considerable amount of research and training about the curriculum. To be honest, research in that depth was something I didn't always get the time to do as a head teacher. The following sessions will hopefully give you and other schools in your local authority or trust the opportunity to hear the main messages from the research that sits behind the fundamental principles of the education inspection framework. We will also share some of our inspection methodology although there will be no surprises for you here. How we inspect is clearly set out in the education inspection framework. You'll probably be aware that some changes were made to the framework in April to take into account changes to our inspection work due to COVID-19. Also, there are updates in relation to nat national statutory changes, such as the lifting of the exemption from inspection for outstanding schools and how a school meets the requirements of the DfE's statutory guidance on relationships and sex education and health education. We've also added a section about remote education. In your invitation to these events, you'll have seen the broad outline for each of the sessions. You may be attending all of these or, or you may have allocated different leaders to attend different sessions. After each webinar event, 
we will send you the recording of the session with the slides so that you can share this more widely with your schools. We would really encourage you to do this. The messages you will hear are firmly rooted in research. They are the messages that inspectors have heard too, and they are the principles by which we will inspect your schools. We've purposely started with two sessions on reading because we know that being able to read well is the gateway to the wider curriculum. So the first session has an emphasis on children who are in the early stages of reading. And throughout the sessions, we'll go on to share our research about building a curriculum right from the early years to key stages four and five. In later sessions, we will also give you some links to research and information that you may be interested in. These are the members of our team who will be involved in these webinars, and you'll notice that we have a number of our curriculum experts presenting the sessions. We've spent a lot of time talking to school leaders and staff over the past few terms about the challenges and sometimes actually the unexpected benefits of the COVID-19 restrictions. This has been through interim visits, monitoring inspections of grade, grade three and four schools and pilot inspections. We've also had regular conversations with local authority leaders. We've consulted widely about remote education as that means of curriculum delivery. In March 2021, Amanda Spillman, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector, reflective, reflected some of the findings from our recent work. We're going to come back to looking at the planning of the wider curriculum in the COVID context in sessions three and four and five. But for now, we're going to start that professional dialogue she mentions here with regards to reading. There is absolutely no school that does not want all their children to learn to read well. Similarly, I've never visited a school where leaders and staff have not been working really hard into teaching children to read. However, we have been to schools where staff have not always been giving quite the right attention to the right things. Some of the best feedback we've received from schools we inspect is how our conversations with them during the inspection have helped them to consider why their actions have not had the impact that they intended on helping all children to read well. One head teacher has actually kindly, kindly offered to share their experience of revising their reading, reading curriculum with you in session two. Hopefully, over the next two sessions, we'll give you the opportunity for the same thought and reflection about the curriculum you have in place to help children to read. But it's going to be in this webinar forum rather than in your schools during inspection. And at this point, I'm very pleased to hand over to Kirsty. Thank you, Kate. Uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here today as part of my role as National Subject Lead for Early Reading. I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of the research, along with findings from inspection, which I hope will be helpful when considering the curriculum for early reading. In today's session, we're going to begin with the importance of reading, moving on to examine some of the features of an effective reading curriculum, before finally thinking about the impact of COVID-19 on the decisions that are made about the reading curriculum. We're going to begin with a brief reminder of the importance of reading. So why is reading so important? Unless pupils can read, they can't access learning to the full. Reading is the gateway to learning in other subjects across the curriculum. We know that reading opens doors in terms of enjoyment, academic success and lifelong opportunity. Fluent readers can learn more simply because they can read and gain knowledge for themselves. And as Michael Moore Pergo beautifully explains it here, reading is the one ability that once set in motion has the ability to feed itself, grow exponentially and provide a basis from which possibilities are limitless. So learn to read accurately by age six, read to learn for the rest of your life. Research has found that being able to read accurately by age six has a strong correlation with future academic success. That's why it's important for schools and for Ofsted to place our attention on making sure that all pupils learn to read as soon as they should. Focusing on getting early reading right will give all children the best possible start. At the same time, of course, we know that there will be some children who've not hit that important milestone of cracking the alphabetic code by the time they're six. 
For them and pupils of any age who are still in the early stages of learning to read, learning to read must therefore be an essential priority. Not only does reading accurately by age six predict future academic success, but the opposite, reading failure, also has a dramatic effect on pupils for life. Research shows that reading failure begins early, takes root quickly and affects students for life. And the research also tells us that the intensity and duration of any intervention that struggling readers need will increase the older that pupils are. And this is why we need to make sure that pupils get the best possible start. And broadly speaking, it will only be those pupils with severe cognitive difficulties or hearing impairments that, that cannot be taught the code. So to just recap this first short session, good readers do well at school and poor readers do not. All pupils need to learn to crack the phonics code as soon as possible because reading failure begins early, takes root quickly and affects pupils for life. And we're now going to move on to consider effective features of a reading curriculum. And within this part of today's session, we're going to cover the following. The simple view of reading. Phonics for reading, spelling and writing. What this means for pupils with special educational needs and or disabilities. And language comprehension and that vocabulary and knowledge gained from a broad curriculum. We're going to take a look at the simple view of reading because it's so helpful in explaining what happens when a child learns to read. Reading's a complex process, but it's useful to think about two dimensions to reading, word recognition and language comprehension. These two dimensions are summarized in a conceptual framework which Goff and Tunma called the simple view of reading. Both word recognition and language comprehension are necessary for confident and competent reading, but neither of them is sufficient on its own. In order to comprehend written texts, children must first learn to recognise, that is decode, the words on the page. High quality phonics teaching secures those crucial skills of word recognition that once mastered, enable children to decode accurately and automatically, and that frees them to concentrate on the meaning of the text. When children begin to learn phonics at the start of reception, they should have already made considerable progress in their language development, and there should be a time-limited focus on decoding. Children should quickly progress from learning to read to reading to learn for both purpose and pleasure. However, if children can't decode well, this affects their comprehension. It also limits the language that they're exposed to because they rely on gaining all new knowledge from an adult reading to them, rather than them being able to read for themselves as well. And we want pupils to quickly get to that top right hand quadrant where they can read words and understand them. But let's first think about the other quadrants and what is happening in each case. So in the bottom right, a child with strong word recognition but poor language comprehension. This might describe a child who's in reception, but perhaps new to English. So they're learning to decode well, but have little understanding of the words they read. In the top left, a child with poor word recognition, but strong language comprehension. This might describe a child who's been read to a lot before school, but perhaps just not been taught phonics yet. And this is the ideal starting point for children beginning reception, because once they learn to decode, they can move really quickly into that top right hand quadrant. And finally, the bottom left, a child with poor word recognition and poor language comprehension. This is possibly where some disadvantaged pupils begin school. They've maybe had limited experiences of being read to and have not been exposed to phonics teaching yet. That's why the emphasis on language and communication in early years is so crucial, so that we have as few children as possible in this quadrant when they start reception. 
And this diagram is known as Scarborough's reading rope. And Scarborough brought, brought together research on reading comprehension to create the notion of the reading rope. Two aspects, language comprehension and word recognition, just as the ones we saw in the simple view of reading, become increasingly intertwined to make a skilled reader who can fully comprehend complex texts. The upper strand is language comprehension, and that includes vocabulary and background knowledge, along with knowledge of genres and, and narrative structures. Where the lower strand is word recognition, and that includes letter sound correspondence knowledge, accurate decoding, phonological awareness, and knowledge of common exception words. These are all crucial to master so that children can recognize words, read them, and if the word is in their vocabulary, understand the meaning. It's important to note that the twisting of the strands together happens once children have got both separate ends of the rope secure. So until pupils are reading accurately and speedily, their working memory is taken up with the decoding, and so they'll find it very difficult to focus on the meaning of the text, even if they understand the words. The two different dimensions of reading need different teaching in the early stages. For example, phonics lessons and story time are both about teaching reading, but they have a very different learning intention. And we're now going to take each of those two different aspects of reading in turn and have a look at them in more detail. So we'll start with word recognition, which begins with phonics. When thinking about phonics, it's important for us to remember that writing is a code. The letters represent the sounds in spoken language. The English code is complex. It's a particularly tricky language to learn. There are more than 44 different sounds or phonemes in English and over 150 ways to represent these phonemes as graphemes. This is why phonics teaching takes two to three years for young children to learn in English. But effective systematic synthetic phonics teaching makes sure that pupils understand these different letter sound correspondences so they can crack the code. Through systematic synthetic phonics, pupils are gradually introduced to letter sound correspondences. They then use this knowledge to read words by blending or synthesizing the sounds. And the code is reversible. So pupils spell words by identifying the sounds in spoken words, that's known as segmenting, and then choose the right sound letter correspondence to write down. Now let's have a look at some problematic approaches, which still exist in some schools, but actually dilute the impact of systematic synthetic phonics. Whole language. At its most extreme, whole language means no direct teaching, teachers providing a literacy rich environment, and children being expected to interpret the meaning of a text based on what they already know. It's related to philosophies that say that children should learn by discovery and problem solving. Next, we have memorizing words. This teaches children to recognize whole words by sight rather than reading each of the sounds. Reading by guessing could be making use of the pictures or it might be the context and mixed strategies. And this describes practice that involves children in selecting from a range of different ways of reading unknown words. So for example, they might use the picture to guess some words, but use phonics for some simple words that can be sounded out easily. And to exemplify some of these issues, we're going to see some words now that are written in Chinese. So unless you can read Chinese, these words will look to you like words written in the English alphabet look to a child who can't read them. This says monkey. How will you remember? You might remember the distinctive set shape that's on the right of the symbol. This looks like monkey, but it's chair. How will you remember? 
you might try to remember the symbol on the left. And this looks like chair, but it is coconut. It's very difficult to, re to remember a word if you don't know what the symbols represent. How many words do you think an average child might be able to learn by the end of secondary school if they never learned the sounds the letters represented? Well, the answer is about 2000. But how many words do you think you need to be able to access an English secondary school curriculum? Tens of thousands. So it's impossible to learn enough words by memorizing the shapes alone. But the good news here is that there's no limit on the number of words that can be stored in the brain when the words have first been processed through blending. Using a range of reading strategies was something that was encouraged in the time of the national strategies. But since then, research has moved on and this is reflected in the national curriculum, which requires pupils to be taught phonics as the one and only method to read unfamiliar words. So why is teaching a range of strategies unhelpful? As we've heard, memorising enough words without phonics isn't possible. Guessing only works in books which are written to encourage people to guess. It's not helpful when texts become more complex and include no pictures. Research has shown that using the context is only successful in about 10% of cases. So teaching systematic synthetic phonics gives pupils a reliable method to decode any unfamiliar word they will come across. So it's a strategy that pupils will be able to use forever. And now I want to talk about fluency because fluency is really important for phonics because when the basics are embedded or stored deeply and they're automatic, so they're easily retrieved, subsequent learning becomes easier. And being accurate and automatic with phonics is necessary for success with reading comprehension and writing composition. Because pupils need to be fluent with decoding, spelling and handwriting if they're to free up their working memory to be able to focus on the meaning of the text they read or when composing a piece of writing. And just as when we drive a car, we've become so automatic with all of the processes involved that our working memory can be focused on what's happening around us. So we remember to indicate, look in the mirrors, change gears and all sorts of other things without even thinking about it. And that's the level of automaticity that we need with phonics to free up the working memory to focus either on that comprehension or that composition. Now, the aim of phonics is obviously for pupils to become fluent decoders and spellers. So we'll first think about how pupils become fluent decoders. They will not pick this up through discovery. They need instruction and they'll get that in their phonics teaching. But they also need planned opportunities for them to practice what they've been taught so that it becomes secure and embedded. And this might take place within a phonics session or at other times of the day. And these are some of the examples of practice. Reading books which are matched to the phonics knowledge. Now this guarantees that pupils will be able to accurately read every word because they already have the knowledge of the letter sound correspondences each word contains. And secondly, rereading these books so that they build a bank of words that can be read automatically. Because once pupils have read a word several times, it becomes part of their orthographic store and they can read these words automatically when they come across them in the future. It might appear that they've learned them by sight, but first they've processed the words through sounding and blending. And this is really crucial as there's no limit to the number of words that can be read automatically if they've first been processed through phonics. So how do pupils become fluent spellers or encoders? And there are some helpful parallels with reading here. Pupils will not pick up transcription, that is spelling or letter formation, through discovery. Again, they need instruction, and this comes through phonics teaching. And once taught, pupils will need those planned opportunities to practice what they've been taught to make sure it's secure and embedded. 
And again, this might take place within the phonics session, but also at other times in the day. And when we think about how pupils practice what they've been taught with spelling and letter formation, then dictation is the writing equivalent to decodable books. And that's why the National Curriculum includes reference to dictation, so that pupils have got lots of practice writing dictated sounds, words or sentences that contain the sound to letter correspondences that they've been taught. And this guarantees that pupils will be able to accurately spell every word and form every letter because they already have the knowledge of the sound to letter correspondences and that letter formation needed in each word. Important to fluency is also the quality and quantity of practice. We're going to explore these themes further later in the session when we consider the implications of COVID-19 on pupils reading. But let's first think about the quantity of practice. Research shows that in two days, a regular reader reads as much as some children do in a year. How can schooling make up for this stark difference? Timetables and the reading curriculum differ hugely between schools. Pupils get different amounts of practice depending on how well reading is prioritised by leaders. It also, of course, differs between children in the same school. Cunningham and Stanovich talk about the Matthew effect, where the rich get rich and the poor get poorer. And they said that very early on, poor readers struggling with phonics are exposed to less text than their more skilled peers. Their deficient decoding and their lack of practice and difficult materials result in unrewarding experiences and less involvement in reading related activities. That delay in automaticity means their working memory is focused on decoding rather than comprehending the text. The sheer volume read by their peers provides them with more advantage. And they went on to say that the difference that we see in reading at age 11 is probably the differential in practice that resulted from early differences in the speed of phonics acquisition. Now, let's now take a look at the historic outcomes for Key Stage 2 reading. And these, of course, don't take into account the implications of COVID-19. So one in four pupils leave primary school unable to read well and two in five disadvantaged pupils leave school unable to read well. Not only does this highlight the problem that not enough primary school pupils are learning to read well enough, it also of course has implications for these pupils as they enter key stage three. And as we know from the introduction to this session, good readers do well at school and poor readers do not. Let's now see what the statistics say about the early stages of reading in the phonic screening check. Well, there was an improvement from an average of 58% in 2012 to 82% in 2019. So after that initial improvement, we've seen a real plateauing of the average proportion of pupils meeting the standard for the last few years. And most concerning is that in 2019, nearly a third of children from disadvantaged backgrounds didn't meet the required standard, as opposed to 15% of those from better off backgrounds. But overall, approximately one in five pupils are starting year two without the decoding skills they need to become more fluent readers. We do know that in the past, many leaders have seen that national average as something to work towards and Ofsted understand the part that we've played in that. However, we know that aiming for a national average is not ambitious enough in the case of teaching children to read. The aim should be for all pupils to reach that standard because we know it's going to give them the best possible chance in year two and beyond. So why is it that some children are not learning to read as soon as they should? Well, many adults in schools were taught differently when they were at school. And so some might not understand the importance of systematic synthetic phonics. They might not have kept up to date with the research about how children learn to read, or perhaps they've not had the training in their school that they need to support them to teach reading effectively. And of course, this leads to a range of methods being used, often unintentionally. And when children are taught other methods, such as looking at the pictures um, and guessing the word, 
then these are problematic because they're inefficient strategies which soon become unusable when there are no pictures and the text gets more complex. In some schools, not all staff are trained in how to teach phonics. So children may work with someone else who's uh, may work with somebody who's not an expert. And this can be particularly the case with children who move into key stage two or key stage three, still unable to read well. And some children find reading difficult and need more practice. The problem is not with the child, but with the lack of practice. And if you remember that driving analogy, some people find learning to drive more difficult than others. They just need a lot more lessons until they've passed their test and all of that knowledge has become secure. Some common misconceptions um, also allow poor practice in schools to persist. So for example, that not all children learn through phonics. However, as we've already heard, all pupils need to learn to crack the phonics code because it's our knowledge of the phonics code which is, allows us to read any unfamiliar word. Some pupils do work out the code for themselves eventually, but too many do not. And we can't leave it to chance for those most vulnerable pupils. So by teaching phonics from the start gives all pupils the best life chances. Another commonly held view is that it's unfair to expect pupils with SEND to be able to learn phonics. And obviously here we must remember that pupils with SEND is not a homogenous group and some as a result of severe, profound or complex learning difficulties will be at a significantly earlier stage in the development of their receptive and expressive communication. But the point is that it, it is the same curriculum journey but that some pupils will be at a different point on that journey. So the same applies about our writing system being a code and that all pupils will need to understand if they're going to be a successful reader and speller. There's not a different curriculum for pupils with SEND. We also know that children who find reading difficult may struggle with auditory skills or visual memory. The great news here is that these can both be taught through phonics. And just as some people need more driving lessons to give them enough practice to be automatic with each process, some pupils with SEND may need more practice with phonics. But it should be that same curriculum, perhaps at an earlier point and with maybe more repetition to really secure that knowledge. An extra support needs to be an urgent priority given the impact that reading has on people's ability to be able to access the wider curriculum. The positive news is that phonics works for all, but harms none. Phonics doesn't hold children back because if they're able to read before they begin learning phonics, um, then research shows that phonics teaching actually helps them to develop their spelling. And of course, alongside the phonics teaching that they're experiencing, because they can already read for themselves independently, they will be reading and learning new knowledge for themselves. We know that some pupils will enter key stage three and will not be fluent readers. Therefore, what is important is for schools to identify pupils' precise needs. So if pupils have not cracked the phonics code, that must be an essential priority for those children. Some pupils might be able to read accurately and they know the phonics code. Perhaps they haven't got the automaticity needed to comprehend what they read. Others might read fluently, but don't have an understanding of what they read to make sense of the text. And things like reading scores and reading ages and SAT scores, they're not going to tell teachers precisely what children are struggling with. And we'll talk about that later. But once assessment has effectively identified what the issue might be, whether that's accuracy, automaticity or understanding, then schools should make sure that pupils receive the additional support that helps them to catch up really quickly so that they can access the full curriculum. Some key points from this part of the session about the curriculum for phonics then. So reading has two dimensions, word recognition and language comprehension, both of which are necessary for competent, confident reading. And having that strong language comprehension 
before children start reception allows children to quickly move from learning to read to reading to learn. And that good phonics teaching enables all pupils to learn to crack the phonics code. And that children need to read with accuracy and automaticity so that it frees up their working memory to focus on the meaning of the text. Phonics works for all but harms none. And all pupils, including those with SEND, need to learn the phonics code. They need to experience the same phonics curriculum. And they may, of course, be at an earlier point than their peers. And their learning might need breaking down into more steps and repeating more often. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Claire Brown, who's going to take you through the next slides. Thank you, Kirsty. Can I just check that you can hear me? Yes, no problem, Claire. Brilliant. OK, um, so I'm going to move us on now to um, think about language comprehension. And we started at the beginning of the webinar with that simple view of reading. And we've looked at, at, at what that means for phonics and for decoding. But now we're going to look at the other dimension of reading, language and comprehension. Moving on to the next slide, let's remind ourselves of that simple view of reading. And as Kirsty highlighted earlier, both word recognition or decoding and language comprehension are really critical for confident and competent reading. Neither is going to be sufficient on its own. And we know that once children can decode fluently and automatically, they should then quickly progress from learning to read to reading to learn for purpose and for pleasure. And if they can't decode well, this will affect their comprehension but it also limits the language that they're exposed to because they rely on gaining all of their new knowledge from what an adult reads to them, rather than them being able to read widely for themselves. And in the next few slides, we're going to focus on some of those essential components in developing that strong language comprehension. Now, you don't need me to say to you, you will know all too well that there is really wide variation in young children's exposure to vocabulary. The research tells us that children with poor language and communication skills at the age of five are six times less likely to do well in English at age 11. And really disturbingly, they're twice as likely to be unemployed by the time they reach their mid thirties. So, we know that the early years are absolutely crucial in developing children's understanding of language. It's the underpinning knowledge, the foundation that they need so that when they learn phonics and they can read fluently, they'll then understand what they read. Children should obviously be exposed to a wide range of books which support their understanding of the world and broaden and deepen their vocabularies. So it's a question of planning that curriculum really carefully and making those choices of texts very deliberately to address those priorities. We know that the quality and quantity of interactions between adults and children should extend children's understanding of vocabulary, the breadth and depth of vocabulary and their use of spoken language. And the choices that leaders make about the curriculum content in early years are really vital if they're going to address any weaknesses in children's language acquisition that are identified on entry to early years. It needs to be a really key consideration when planning the specific content and the sequence in which it's taught. Before reception, the focus really should be on language and communication rather than phonics. And that creates that readiness for learning to read. We know that if pupils have strong language comprehension by the time they begin reception, then they're more likely to very quickly move from learning to read to reading to learn. And as inspectors, we don't expect to see phonics lessons in pre-reception settings. But what we do expect staff to be teaching is a really carefully chosen, well-planned, well-sequenced curriculum in the early years that's going to give children the foundations that they need for the rest of their schooling. So let's just have a think for a moment about some of those really important ways that, that children develop their language in the early years. 
And I know that many, if not all of these, will be absolutely familiar to you. So we're thinking about exposure to and joining in with rhymes and stories and alliteration. We're thinking about listening to an adult read really carefully chosen literature that covers a breadth of genre, including stories and nonfiction and rhymes. Adults listening to children, talking to them and modelling new language and a breadth of vocabulary. And really importantly, routinely introducing new words to children and supporting and encouraging them to use them and to own them. And we know that many of these opportunities happen incidentally in the early years. Some will be chosen very deliberately by teachers and other adults, but it's vitally important that they're not left to chance, that actually leaders consider these aspects and make sure that they're really carefully mapped into a well-sequenced curriculum that supports that language acquisition. We know that vocabulary reflects what you know about the world and a really good vocabulary allows you to communicate effectively. There's no better index to accumulated knowledge and general competence than the size of a person's vocabulary. It's actually a really convenient proxy for a whole range of educational attainment abilities. In, and it's not just about skills in reading, writing, listening and speaking, but also that more broad general knowledge of things like science and history and the arts. And there are really significant implications for the curriculum if it's going to counter the word gap that Hart and Ridley identified that tells us and predicts the educational trajectory of children from when they're just four years old. So if we want to give all children opportunity, a really good place to start right from the early years and then beyond is by teaching a wide range of curriculum subjects and through a breadth of books that will give a wide vocabulary and a rich understanding of the meaning of the words that children encounter. If we think about language comprehension beyond just the early years, if we don't introduce pupils and particularly some of our disadvantaged children to those more challenging texts, then who will? Schools have the greatest opportunity to broaden pupils' cultural capital through access to that broad range of literature. But interestingly, Stanovich, in the research referenced on the slide there, highlights that 90% of vocabulary is mainly encountered through reading rather than speech. And his research about fiction and academic texts has real implications for pupils in all key stages. And that's why the choices that adults make in schools about the texts that pupils read throughout the time in primary and secondary school is so important right from the early years, as indeed are the choices that the pupils themselves make about their reading materials, and hence the importance of adults influencing those choices too where possible. We know that pupils need to have the right high quality texts, both to select from themselves and also that are chosen to be shared with them. Those that provide exposure to complex vocabulary, to ideas, and not just fiction, because we know that fiction doesn't always provide the breadth of vocabulary or the exposure um, and the experience of syntax that pupils need. And critically, leaders and teachers need to make those really considered choices about the texts because of the vocabulary and the ideas and concepts and knowledge that pupils need to be exposed to, rather than, for example, just because a text happens to match a broad topic that's been planned. So if we think about vocabulary knowledge and familiarity with syntax and narrative forms, these don't actually all come from teaching English. And this slide illustrates how the wider curriculum plays its part. It's part of how we ensure that cultural capital is developed. And let's face it, we all know that in the past, some schools have sometimes narrowed the curriculum in Key Stage 2 to focus mainly on English and mathematics. And that's been at the expense of the wider curriculum. And we recognise why that situation may have arisen. But actually, all of the research shows us that a really well-planned, well-taught wider curriculum 
will underpin pupil's comprehension. That relevant prior knowledge is crucial if pupils are going to have the capacity to understand people and the physical world. And the research on that is pretty clear and has been for actually for decades. Where weaker readers are given a text on a subject that they know something about, they stand a much better chance of being able to understand it than actually those who we perceive to be stronger readers. You might know or have come across the study by Recht and Leslie in the late 80s. They actually identified a group of good or strong readers and a group of poorer readers through a reading test. And then they tested them on their comprehension of a passage about baseball. Some of the readers in each of those groups, the, the stronger readers and the poorer readers, knew a lot about baseball and some not so much. And what that research showed was that the poorer readers who knew a great deal about baseball did much better than the good readers who didn't. In other words, their general knowledge of the subject overcame some of the weaknesses in their reading ability. And this means we can see a real correlation between world knowledge, general knowledge, and reading comprehension. In essence, what we're saying is the more stuff you know about the world, the more general knowledge you have, the more likely it is that you'll know at least a bit about whatever passage you happen to hit. This point really resonated for me recently. Um, I was reading personally um, a, a novel called A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Towles. You might have come across it if you haven't. It's a really excellent book, which I'd highly recommend. I consider myself a pretty capable, fluent reader, but actually my rather limited knowledge of early 20th century Russian history really got in my way of understanding that text. And um, I suspect as many would in that circumstance, I resorted to a good deal of Googling to overcome that so that I understood what was being referenced in the, in the novel. But the key there is I had the reading stamina and the determination to cope with that obstacle and that barrier. And we know that there's a real risk that pupils will be hindered significantly when they lack that depth of knowledge that's necessary to comprehend what they're reading. And at best, their understanding of what they're reading will be impeded and at worst, they may just disengage from reading in those circumstances. So in summary, what we're saying is, once we can decode fluently, actually that reading comprehension depends really heavily on knowledge. And the wider curriculum needs to be carefully planned to support the knowledge and the vocabulary that pupils need. And if we fail to provide that solid grounding in basic subjects across the wider curriculum, then we inadvertently limit children's ability in reading comprehension. I'm now going to hand over to Kate, who is going to take us through the next section. Thank you, Claire. So this is something that's in all of our minds, isn't it? Um, you know, the impact of COVID-19 on what it's like for a pupil um, in school at this current time. Despite schools' really great efforts over the last year, um, providing education remotely, educating some pupils on site at the same time, making every decision with pupil safety and safeguarding in mind, just to mention a few of the challenges there, we know that pupils' education has been affected. Many leaders have shared with us the challenge of providing the phonics and reading curriculum remotely. Leaders know that some children have just not had the practice they usually would. We have also heard of some um, schools where, you know, this has been really effective and um, we have seen that children have continued that reading curriculum um, in the same way that was originally planned. In many, we, we know that leaders um, have found real differences there. We also understand that what sits behind that now is the challenge that leaders face in finding out what pupils know and can remember after the very different experiences that they may have had during that time. We all know that committing knowledge to our long-term memories takes practice and repetition. So as elite school leaders, how, how are you making those decisions and prioritising what pupils learn next? So we're going to make some references here to the information and guidance we can see from the DfE, particularly today what it says about reading. We can consider what and how you assess and the implications that this may have for your intended curriculum. We know that schools will have already put great efforts into defining a curriculum. During 
recent time, you may have had to deliver some of this curriculum remotely and actually may need to continue to do so, for example, if individuals or groups of pupils are self-isolating. So let's start with a reminder of that DfE guidance from February. I'll just give you a moment to cast your eyes again over that. Just attention there to any gaps relating to reading that could be significant, given the impact reading has on pupils' ability to access the whole curriculum and learn by reading for themselves. Kirsty and Clara have both talked about that already this afternoon. And important here in this slide to note that, that there is recognition that you may need to make modifications to the curriculum and that assessment should be formative giving you the information you need without being burdensome. And, and that's the challenge in itself really, isn't it? Perhaps important to remind you here that Ofsted do not look at internal assessments and tracking systems. We simply ask you what your assessments tell you about what pupils know and what they tell you about which pupils are not doing as well as they should or as you had expected. And just looking at that guidance again for reception children here with the emphasis on spotting gaps in phonics, language and mathematics. The guidance states that schools can use existing flexibilities to create time to cover the most important content in which pupils are not yet secure. Simply, it's up to you as school leaders to decide what are the most important aspects you want to give attention to now. Here in the guidance, it's clear that early reading, both phonics and language comprehension, are priorities. What do pupils know? I'm sure this question has been asked in all of your schools. Leaders want to assess what pupils know and any gaps that they may have in particular aspects or subjects in the curriculum. You'll be considering what you're checking, for example, making sure that you're checking what pupils have actually been taught over the last year, rather than what was initially planned for them to learn. And indeed, whether as leaders you need to check or assess particular aspects, assessment isn't always necessary or appropriate. For example, in other subjects, if you know pupils would normally learn about the Vikings in history, but that's an aspect that didn't get covered in, re in the last year, you don't need an assessment to identify the lost learning. The learning isn't lost, it just wasn't taught at this time. And when leaders know what pupils know, it will then be that those, there's that consideration about implications for what needs to come next. Are, are there any aspects of your curriculum that need to be adapted? which pupils need extra support and actually it may be that different pupils need extra support um, than before um, the lockdown periods. Of course that has implications um, for the phonics curriculum and for pupils language development so at this point I'm going to hand back to Kirsty to look at those aspects. Thank you Kate. So we're first of all going to consider phonics. Well assessment needs to determine whether pupils have remembered the intended reading curriculum. It also needs to identify the gaps in pupils' knowledge. Some assessments might not be as useful in establishing this information. So what we're going to do is consider a few types of assessment that are used in schools and schools have told us about these and we're going to think about whether they might be helpful to teachers in finding out if pupils have learned the intended curriculum and what gaps pupils have. So would past phonics screening check papers help? Well, not really, because if pupils are given a past phonics screening check paper, it will give them a score. And that score won't inform staff about the gaps that pupils have in their learning. That's because it's not diagnostic. It also doesn't cover the full range of taught letter sound correspondences, particularly, of course, for the pupils that are only part way through the phonics curriculum. So, how about reading tests? Well, again, not very helpful. If pupils are given a score or a reading age on a test, it won't tell staff about whether pupils remembered the intended curriculum or if there are specific gaps in learning. Again, it's not diagnostic. Summative tests are designed to sample a sub, uh, to test a sample of the subject domain. They just provide an indication of how well that curriculum has been learned and remembered. 
but they don't cover the full taught curriculum. So reading ages, scores in a test or scores in the phonic screening check have got limited use in informing planning and teaching. What they do do is they rank pupils. So they are useful in identifying which pupils are behind, but crucially, they don't tell you what the children are behind with. And that's the information that's needed to really inform planning. So let's try another. How about using a child's colour book band? Well, no, not that one either, because assessment should determine what book a child should be reading, not the other way around. And in the early stages of reading, books need to be matched to pupils' phonic knowledge. And that is based on what teachers already know they can read accurately. How about hearing a child read individually? Well, this might tell staff whether the taught curriculum has been remembered and whether there are any gaps but only if the book included all examples of the taught curriculum which is being assessed. That's probably going to be unlikely um, in one book. But this experience would be useful in telling teachers whether pupils can read familiar words speedily and unfamiliar words accurately by sounding out and blending. So finally, carrying out assessments of the taught curriculum. Yes, you'll be pleased to know this is the one surefire way of finding out what you need to know. And actually, good phonics programmes include assessments like these as a resource for teachers. Having completed then an assessment of the taught curriculum, the next job is to consider what to do with the findings. Teachers would want to find out if there are any gaps for children in a class or a year group. Because when you know the gaps, you can determine your priorities for the curriculum in relation to your findings. One important thing to consider when making adaptations to the curriculum is that you can't change the curriculum for phonics. And that's because it's hierarchical and needs to build sequentially. So we can't decide to miss out some of the letter sound correspondences because those gaps would prevent further learning. The phonics programme itself shouldn't be changed because it is the progression model. What might need to be different is the point in the programme which pupils have securely reached. And this might be several weeks or even months behind where you would normally expect pupils to be at this point in time. And it may be that some aspects need recapping, or it could be that some aspects are not secure at all and they need prioritising. But if pupils are behind where you would usually expect them to be, then the priority should be for all pupils to reach that usual expected point as soon as possible. If you go back to teaching, which should have taken place over a month or a term ago, um, then how will you get back to those usual expectations of the phonics curriculum? Because if you carry on as normal with the same timetable for phonics, then pupils will always be behind where they were expected to be. However, if you rush through the program too quickly, then that might have gaps that could you know, prevent further learning. So finding more time for phonics is really um, the solution. And, and I think there's, there's two options here. First, making the most of the time that you already have. And a great way to find additional time is to think carefully about every activity choice so that pupils get as much practice with the intended learning as they can. Some of the less effective examples that we see on inspection are things like making Play-Doh models or drawing pictures of objects that contain the sounds that are being learnt. Whereas more effective examples would be providing um, children with fast paced reading of words on word cards because that gives them that practice. And the second option is to find additional time for further practice. And we're going to look at some examples of that shortly. Here are some of the things that you might want to consider about your systems and routines and timetabling to help make the most effective use of time. Um, some schools tell us that they group pupils um, 
according to their gaps in their learning. And this can be effective, but just be aware that obviously if there's not an increase in the amount of practice that those groups have who are behind, um, then they will not catch up to the expectations of the phonics programme. Another thing to think about is the amount of time allocated to phonics and reading and writing every day. You might want to increase it or try and use that time more efficiently, or in fact both. You might want to lengthen the phonics session itself, or some schools have told us that they've found it better to have additional short recaps throughout the day. And we know that many schools have a 20 minute session allocated to phonics. And if this is the case, you might want to consider whether 20 minutes is going to be enough and think about what you are prioritising in the remaining, remaining time of each day. And then it's looking at other times during the school day uh, where there might be opportunities. For example, whenever pupils are reading and writing, is there a chance for them to practice what they've already been taught? An example here might be thinking about how you use dictation. Is that part of your daily phonics session or is it something that happens at another time? And could you be doing more of this? Because it is often the weaker element of phonics practice when we, uh, from what we see on inspection. And how are parents being guided to support their child's learning at home? So are the, are the pupils taking reading books home which help them to practice the phonics they've learned so far using those decodable matched books? And how often are they expected to do this? And what systems do you have in place if that doesn't happen? How are you making sure that people still get the chance to practice reading as much at home? Some schools have told us how they've had to have arrangements for quarantining the books, for example. And do parents know what their child's gaps are? Because now you've got that valuable assessment information, has that been shared? And have parents got access to things like word cards or other resources that might help them to support that um, letter sound correspondence practice at home? Children need further practice every day, either independently or supported by a member of staff, and that will give them the practice they need in the phonics that they've been taught. And that's what helped to secure and embed their learning. And as we looked at earlier, to develop the automaticity that they need, the quality and quantity of this practice are vital. So to practice decoding, to read words, children need practice reading words and sentences which have been matched to their phonic knowledge so they can be successful. And to practice encoding, to spell words, Children will need practice writing dictated sounds or words and sentences that contain those known sound to letter correspondences. These opportunities can be incorporated when children encounter reading and writing in a whole range of subjects. So for example, in science, teachers might ask pupils to label the parts of a plant. Some of the words may be provided by the teacher as they contain sound letter correspondences that have not been taught yet, but other words might be written by the pupils as a way of practicing spelling using their phonics knowledge. And let's have a look at the importance of pedagogical choices in early writing. Direct instruction of transcriptional knowledge is essential because we know that this knowledge is not picked up through play and therefore it needs to happen in adult directed time. And given that that can be limited, especially in early years, it's particularly important that every minute with the teacher counts. It needs to focus on the most important content. At first, pupils will need lots of practice with the individual components, those building blocks for success. So as, as an example, pen grip, letter formation, sound to letter correspondence for spelling, and being able to articulate and structure ideas in speech. Because pupils won't get better at something complex like writing stories by writing lots of stories. What they need is to practice each of those components individually so that when they do com combine all of that component knowledge together to write a story, they've got enough automaticity with the basics to free up their working memory to focus on things like the content and the structure of the writing. 
So act activity should really engineer success. For example, the teacher may dictate words which contain known sound and letter correspondences and using that known letter formation. For example, in reception, children are writing a shopping, a shopping list. So let's imagine it's fairly early on in their phonics experience in the autumn term. Now, by this time, they are probably going to be able to write the word ham. But at that point, they won't have the phonic knowledge to write words like chips and cheese, which contain consonant and vowel digraphs that have not been taught yet. And what does that mean for emergent writing or free writing when children just choose to write independently? Well, direct instruction of transcription and direct instruction of oral composition doesn't stop those children that can already write from choosing to do so independently or curb the enthusiasm of children who choose to mark make as they play. But what is important is getting all children off the starting block so that they have all of that component knowledge needed to be successful with writing. And it's important to make the best use of the time when they're with an adult to do that. And finally, regarding additional practice, there are some activities which are not suitable for independent phonics practice, but are common features in reception classrooms. Independent phonics practice should not include activities where children are likely to focus on something other than reading or writing. For example, finding letters in the sand. Because children are likely to focus more on playing with the sand than on learning than learning about the letters. As Willingham said, memory is the residue of thought. So whatever children think about is what they will remember. Now we're going to think about the pupils who may be further behind their peers and need additional small group help or one to one support. And when considering additional support for these pupils that need to catch up and keep up, it's important to think about what assessment has revealed about the gaps in their phonic knowledge. And that, of course, is the starting point to determine how to address these gaps specifically. It's very important that extra support uses a consistent approach. And that's because all pupils need to know the alphabetic code and need to know how to read words by sounding and blending. So any intervention should be using that same systematic synthetic phonics approach rather than another method, for example, memorizing words by sight and guessing using the context. And you don't need any fancy intervention program here to do this. If you've got a consistent, reliable program, use the same methods, the same resources, the same routines that you do in your program, just more of the same until that learning becomes secure and embedded. And short, sharp bursts are very effective here. Um, examples we've seen in schools are, you know, pupils arriving five minutes early before the start of the day, or a TA checking some letter sound correspondences as they line up for lunch, those sorts of things. When there's not a consistent approach, then children might be allowed to use other strategies to read unfamiliar words. Now, these strategies then become reinforced, and so using them becomes a habit that's difficult to break. Pupils can't read age appropriate text because the strategy or the strategies aren't reliable. For example, when there are unfamiliar words, but there's no obvious context clues. So they actually get less practice using phonics, although they need more. And they may become discouraged and possibly even disruptive or withdrawn. So extra help, what should it be? Well, as we've just heard, it needs to be matched to the precise gaps in pupils' learning and consistent with the school's phonic program. Based on the assessments, individual or small group happening at a regular time in a quiet place with a well-trained adult. And leaders really need to recognise as a priority the, these extra sessions with a real effort to try and avoid any disruption or cancellation. And it is likely that some pupils with SEND will need extra help with reading. All of the bullets here still apply. Staff should use that same approach with lots of repetition and overlearning. And crucially, this doesn't mean that phonics doesn't work. 
it just might take those pupils longer to reach that level of automaticity, just like it takes some people longer to learn to drive and they need more lessons. For children who are struggling with reading in Key Stage 2, the curriculum needs to be really carefully considered to focus on them cracking that phonics code as soon as possible. Otherwise, they're going to struggle to access the wider curriculum. And, and if they've not cracked the phonics code, it should be their greatest priority. So spending time on things like written reading comprehension activities or writing stories, which they probably won't have the phonic knowledge to do so with success, is not going to help these pupils. Pupils who are behind in Key Stage 2 do still need access to age appropriate text, though, with their peers so that they don't miss out on developing their understanding of language and story structures. However, they can discuss these books orally and that will give them more time for catching up with phonics. And this slide reminds us that extra help is difficult to organise and so it won't always happen unless it is a, a priority for leaders. And when helping older pupils, the approach is much the same. First and foremost, it's important to establish what the issue is. Is the issue a decoding one? Can pupils read unfamiliar words accurately by sounding and blending? Or have they cracked the phonics code and can read accurately, but just haven't had enough practice reading to read the words with the automaticity that's needed? Or do pupils have difficulty understanding the words that they read? It could, of course, be an issue with one or more uh, of these. So again, it would be about using assessments from a suitable programme to decide where to begin the teaching. And following the same curriculum, but perhaps with more age appropriate resources. And making sure that that extra um, practice is given um, regularly. And we're going to explore more fully some of the issues facing struggling readers in secondary school when we get to session two. And now we're going to move on to briefly take a look at dealing with gaps in pupils' language comprehension. Here are some of the things that you might want to consider. Have you prioritised specific vocabulary, um, which is really crucial for children to understand and be able to use? Have you thought about the specific books and songs and rhymes that you're going to select to support pupils' language development? Books are also a great way to address some of the knowledge gaps in the wider curriculum. Schools have told us about examples um, such as dealing with some of the knowledge from a misunit of work on World War II in history by choosing to read a book in story time, which is set in that period, knowing that some of the intended knowledge can be gained through reading and discussing the story. Another example from Key Stage 1 Science was um, making use of songs to help pupils remember the main parts of the human body that they needed to know as part of their science work. It's always worth considering the quality and quantity of interactions between adults and children, because that's great at helping to develop children's understanding and use of language. How much time is dedicated to story time each day? And children who are behind with decoding, they still need access to those age appropriate stories because that is going to support their language development. So let's take a look at some of the key points then from this last part of the session about the impact of COVID-19 and the implications that has for the reading curriculum. Phonics and language comprehension need to be a priority. Assessment should tell you whether the taught curriculum has been learned and remembered. But the starting point in the phonics programme might need adjustment to reflect where pupils' gaps are. You might want to look at routines and systems to create some more time to make up for lost learning. And extra support needs to be a priority for pupils that are even further behind their peers. And now I'm going to hand over to Kate. Thank you, Kirsty. We felt that it was important just to deliver a short um, slide here about delivering the curriculum for reading remotely, because we know that the reading and phonics curriculum has had to be delivered remotely at least for a few months of this year. And you're probably aware that we've published some of our key findings about good practice with remote education. 
The first point here is that remote education is simply a way of delivering the curriculum. Everything we know about what a good curriculum looks like still applies. Remote education, whether that's online or with paper-based resources, is just that way of delivery. So inspectors will give attention to the quality of the curriculum still um, when, when they're speaking to leaders. And if some of that, the way that has been delivered is remotely, that is the opportunity for leaders to talk about that. We know that the remote education curriculum for phonics has needed to be aligned to the school's phonics program as much as possible. So again, that same curriculum is helping pupils build on that expected knowledge over time. Our brains actually don't learn any differently using remote education. So everything we know about cognitive science and learning still applies. So just as in the classroom, most pupils will be novices in what we're teaching them in phonics. So we can't expect them to be able to discover that new phonics content for themselves through tasks, projects and playing games. And, and there really has been some of the challenge about delivering this remotely and then relying on the support children may have at home. We know that phonics needs direct instruction to teach new content. Keep it simple, um, as we've heard in the last part of the session, you know, focus on that curriculum and delivering that, repeating that, giving opportunities to practice and rehearse and become successful. Focusing on the basics along the same lines there, things that are already intended within your curriculum. And feedback, retrieval, practice and assessment, um, we know that that has been a challenge to check on that. Um, so having a system for when you do need to deliver the remote, uh, the curriculum remotely, if unfortunately you have to do that um, for groups of pupils or, or larger cohorts of pupils, um, knowing about how to check on um, what it is that pupils have learned. And Kirsty spent quite a lot of time on that this afternoon. And knowing that live lessons aren't always best, I know there's a lot of ongoing debate about this, it's the best way that you can deliver the, the curriculum you have for your pupils and actually recorded lessons produced externally that are aligned with your programme can really allow schools to easily draw on high quality lessons taught by expert subject leaders. So that is the end of most of our presentation this afternoon. Um, we thank you very much um, to those of you who sent us questions ahead of the session. We did try as far as possible to answer those throughout the presentation, but we have a couple of additional questions that have come through since. And I'm just going to check that Claire is there to be able to answer some of the um, questions and to look at the questions that have been coming in as well. Are you there, Claire? <laughs> I am, I am, Kate, and apologies because I've got builders outside the house making a really <laughs> infernal racket. So apologies to anybody for the background effects that we've got going on at the moment. <laughs> no problem. I can't hear anything at the moment, so uh, <laughs> it, we can't hear this end. Um, I think, Claire, probably what we'll do is, is go through as many of the questions as we can. We need to leave a couple of minutes at the end just for the last couple of slides. But if we don't get anything answered in this session, we, we can pick those up in session two. Absolutely, they can be picked up at the beginning of the next session and obviously all of those recordings are available even if perhaps some of the those who are attending on the call aren't joining us um, live in the next session. Yeah. So, so there is a question that we had beforehand, can I hand that one straight to you Claire, um, that came in about how, how might an inspection look at how equality and diversity are celebrated and promoted through the reading curriculum? Yeah. So this is a really good question. And, and I suppose the first thing to say is that we wouldn't usually on inspection come in with a direct question to leaders asking specifically, how have you, um, you know, promoted and celebrated equality and diversity through the reading curriculum? But we may be asking a broader question about how leaders are ensuring that equality and diversity are celebrated and promoted through all of the school's work. And it would be up to leaders really to decide what they wanted to share with inspectors. And I'm pretty sure that that would draw from a very wide range of evidence of the school's work. But obviously it would be really helpful if leaders did want to draw inspectors' attention to the choices that have been made, for example, through the reading curriculum and in other curriculum areas mm -hmm. to promote quality and diversity. And so what we'd be doing as, as a kind of routine aspect of our um, deep dive activities and the different elements of the deep dives, we'd be building that in. So we'd be talking to subject leaders about the rationale for the choices that they've made about their curriculum. So it would obviously come through those discussions, but then also about how we talk to leaders, about how they've assured themselves that the curriculum is being delivered effectively and 
really importantly, it's securing the impact that they intended when they've set out that curriculum and those choices. So it would naturally come through those sorts of discussions. Thank you, Claire. While you're having a look through the question bar, there is also a question that's come in. Um, I'm going to direct to you, Kirsty, if you're there. Yeah, I'm here. How does um, the reading scheme and fidelity to one scheme fit into the early phonics judgment? Okay, so um, well, we don't make a judgment about phonics. It's obviously part of the judgment that's made on the quality of education. So fidelity to a scheme doesn't have a direct link with a judgment at all. Um, but what uh, leaders, what inspectors would be looking for is what leaders are using, how consistently they're following a programme, because we know that the impact that that has, as, as we've seen today. But actually, there's more coming in session two on that. So I would say, hold on, and hopefully you'll find out more there, where we explore the early reading evaluation criteria. Thank you, Kirsty. Claire, anything there that we can pick up today? Of course, of course, there's a couple of things that have come through. Um, some of the questions actually relate to older readers, Kirsty, and I suspect this is something you're going to... Session two. Yeah. Session two. Session two. But just to reassure those people that have asked those specific questions, and I suppose it, it links back to what you've already said about assessment. You know, is there a baseline or a test that would be recommended at the start of key stage three so that actually um, teachers and leaders can identify the specific reading needs that key stage three pupils have? I suppose that links back to what you were saying about making sure that the assessment fits the purpose, doesn't it? Is there anything yeah. you'd like to touch on there? No, I think that I think you've covered it there, Claire, and I think there'll be more to come in session two. Yeah. And then we've got Sarah and, Hubbard as well, haven't we, joining us, who's also yeah. the English lead. Um, and she, she's got a session particularly focused on secondary reading as well. So hopefully, well, well what we'll do is make sure those questions are answered mm. within that session. And similarly, someone's gone on to ask about the recommended approach to teach those struggling readers in secondary schools. Is it that you use phonics rather than perhaps some of the other whole school reading strategies and approaches that some people you know, will be using, such as reading reconsidered or reciprocal reader, accelerated reader, those sorts of things. I guess a similar message around that too, Kirsty. Yeah, similar. I mean, it's back to the assessment and ident identifying what are those gaps, because the, the phonics gap is always the first thing that needs to be resolved. So it's finding out, do they understand the phonics code? If not, that's the first job. Um, then it may be that they, they actually understand that code and they can read accurately, but not automatically enough. And that might be as a, just a result of a lack of practice. And then finally, yeah. there's, the, there's the understanding of the words as well, which could be another issue. Um, so I suppose it's always about getting to the, the assessment to tell you what you need to know so that that teaching can be specifically matched to those needs, uh, but certainly looking at decoding as the first in the first place. Brilliant. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, we've had a question um, relating to, um, well, the, the question basically is about, you know, the words that are taught that are not um, phonetically decodable. Yeah. Which are typically, re typically reflected in phonics schemes. Um, and, and, and some schemes, for example, Read, Write, Inc. encourage the use of red words or sight mm -hmm. vocabulary to enable fluency. What's your take on that? Is that what you would be saying about those words? We, we need to be careful how we think about the, those words. Uh, they're, they're referred to as common exception words in the national curriculum. Um, they should be kept to an absolute minimum in the early stages because they don't conform to the most normal grapheme phoneme correspondences that children are being taught. That's why we keep them to a minimum. And when they are introduced, they are taught, but they are definitely not taught as whole words that children should learn to recognise by sight. So teachers would be expected to draw attention to the parts of the word that the children did know how to blend, sound out and blend. And the teacher would then draw their attention to that particularly tricky part and tell them what that was so that they were able to read it when they came across it in a book. But if we didn't include any of those words at all, Claire, we, we would have um, we'd have a real difficulty in actually getting children to read very early on. And the great thing is with systematic synthetic phonics is very soon children can be reading a book um, just knowing a few sounds, but we do have to put a very small number of those common exception words in there. You know, otherwise you couldn't have things like the. Uh, you'd find it quite hard to write a book without the word the in it. It would be a struggle for sure. <laughs> um, 
just just one final question i think and, and then a couple of others which are perhaps a little bit more complex we could perhaps pick up at the beginning of the next session because i know we've not got an awful lot of time but um we've had a question about what what expectations there are or what what, what your advice would be kirsty around what's published on a school's website with regards to reading um, well, the requirement from the DfE is that you need to have your phonics program on your website so that parents know what that is that it's been used and also any reading schemes that you use. So that is a requirement. And actually, um, there's also requirements to have detail about your curriculum for English more generally. And that's something that the national curriculum um, has within its requirements as well as for the DfE. So, yeah, it would be about your English curriculum as a whole, but also particularly those schemes that are used. That's great. Thank you, Kirsty. And I'm going to hand over to Kate, um, who I know is going to talk to us a little bit about the um, next session. Thank you. Yes, just to really say what's coming up um, next. In session two, we're going to cover how we inspect reading. Um, so as I've already mentioned, Sarah Hubbard, our National Lead for English, um, will also be talking about reading in secondary schools. It's really important to us that we make these sessions relevant to you. Um, so I know we may have many secondary colleagues on, on this call today, and I think that is fantastic because actually early reading doesn't just happen in primary schools, it happens in secondary schools too. So thank you if you're a secondary colleague and you're here. Hopefully you'll see the journey that we're taking you on over the series of five webinars when we're looking at the wider curriculum um, and as children you know, move on through secondary school. So because you know, we, we really want to make them right for you, if you have any particular questions from today's session we'll pick up the the couple that we've got um, from, from this um, from the chat bar here but if you think of anything else um, please do send them to the regional support team's email address that you signed up with and we will do our very best to answer those either as part of the actual session when, when we're, we're putting that together or as, as the question and answer section at the end in addition, closer to the end of this series of five webinars, if you think they've been useful and you'd like further opportunities to be part of these events, so for example, we're going to be looking more closely at history and languages, and if you might like an emphasis on different curriculum subjects, do let us know. We have a really fantastic team of curriculum experts who would really like to work with you as you consider your curriculum. And um, the other bit of um, informing you of what's going on here is about the new publication from the curriculum unit. So in April, we began our journey towards publishing subject reports for each area of the curriculum. And these reports start with a research review. Our first review in science is now available and is accompanied by two short videos from our subject lead. We're going to be releasing another few um, videos over the next few months. What we will try and do, because these are again a really good starting point if you're really considering a subject in, in your curriculum, is we, throughout the series of five um, sessions, will give you some links and connections to the resources that we think you might find useful um, and that you might want to refer to in your schools. Thank you very much. At this point, I'm just going to pass over to Emma again. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, my colleagues, Kirsty, Claire and Kate, for a fabulous session and some really good learning for all of us. The thing that shrieks to me through all of this is about the importance of curriculum from early years through to the end of your schooling and the fact that we need as professionals to work together throughout because we can support reading by supporting language and we can support language by thinking very carefully about our curriculum throughout horizontally and vertically as a child moves through their various schools. Thank you everybody for coming. We've really appreciated having this opportunity to talk. Hope it's been helpful. And as Kate said, if you have any additional questions, don't hesitate to get in touch. Like you, we want the very best for our children and young people. And we look forward to seeing you for session two. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.